Welcome to the Big Fat Real Estate Checks Podcast with Marco Kozlowski, where we help investors like you get the knowledge and skills you need to replace your J-O-B with passive cash flow for life. Hey, everyone. Welcome to Big Fat Real Estate Checks. My name is Marco Kozlowski, and I'm here with Frank. <laughs> Can't even say your name, Frank. Francesco Galluccio. I'm a little tongue-tied. And uh, Gabriel Areish. Frank is from Montreal. Gabriel is from no, Montreal. No, the other way around, buddy. What are oh you mixing this up? What, 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 what are you eating with me today? What, what you smoking there, buddy? I don't know. Frank the, li- Fra- Frank the library. <laughs> oh, my goodness. What, All right, got, what are you calculating? All right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my gosh. If you weren't uh, in the inside joke, you wouldn't know what the hell we're talking about. But Frank is from Toronto. Uh, Gabriel is from Montreal. And I am from Crazy Town, apparently. So uh, welcome, everyone. Looking forward to a great episode today. We're getting close to our 100th episode. And uh, today will be our second last before we take a uh, little vacay where we're going to be able to do what we want when we want in the order we want to do things in. And uh, we'll discuss that more on this next episode. So don't miss that one. And of course, speaking of next or previous episodes, don't miss the last ones, especially the first 10. So you understand asset-based lending, how that works. Uh, We're able to, uh, pretty much buy anything that we want as long as it's at the right price or the right terms using asset-based lending or creative strategies. And of course, our mission is to help you use skills instead of money to acquire real estate and to have passive income and to enjoy passive income. And of course, uh, have the lifestyle that you really need to have in order to really enjoy this life that we have as we know it. And uh, let's go. So I think we're going to discuss today asset classes, uh, pros and cons of different asset classes, because uh, I know Frank. Uh, when I first started, met, met, when I first met you, when I first started teaching this many years ago, uh, we did single families. Uh, same with uh, Gabe and uh, you know your your other partner. Uh, so you know we, we've 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 really evolved over time over different asset classes, and there are different market cycles for different asset classes. So it'd be kind of fun to to talk about today. Um, what should you be doing now with the economy the way it is uh, as the market goes down, which, you know, where the opportunities are, I think it might be a little fun, a uh, little tete tete here and as to how we can make things uh, a little bit interesting and spicy for our listeners. All right. So which asset class do we want to start first? I know uh, Frank most likely wants to do single families. I don't know. You seem, a little deli- you, you, you seem a little delayed, <laughs> Frank. What's going on? <laughs> I feel like, oh my goodness, that's so funny. Uh, yeah, you know what? Uh, single family. I, I know that when, when I first met you, Marco, that's what you were preaching and, and teaching back then. And yeah, I'm a little biased on single family because it made me a lot of money um, and it worked out for us, thankfully. And uh, listen, I, I know with, with the single families, yes, the, the, the biggest con and the biggest you know, elephant in the room is if you lose that tenant, now all of a sudden you're 100% uh, uh, vacant. Uh, but there is strategies to get into uh, single family, plan it out right where, you know, just before you close, Marco, and this is what we did on a couple of the properties. Uh, actually, one of them is which uh, my daughter got was, so we had a single family out near uh, the Tampa area in Florida. And before we closed, we reached out and already started soliciting and marketing for uh, someone to rent, someone to lease the property and with an option to buy. So we we're uh, trying to attract those that, uh, wanted home ownership, but for some reason couldn't get home ownership. A lot of them had, you know, a bruised credit rating from from the crash, uh, but nothing to do with their income. Their income was very healthy. It's just, you know, the typical banks, you know, the Chases and the Bank of Americas, you know, if you don't have a 620 uh, credit score, they won't look at you. Maybe they came a little bit shy uh, of that. So we were targeting those people. And actually, when we closed, we already had two or three um, qualified uh, families and we were attracting families back then to do a lease with an option to buy uh, at a predetermined sale price. So you already knew how much profit we we're going to make. We already knew how much down payment we were going to get from these folks, and we already knew how much cash flow we were going to get even before we closed. So the pro is that you bought it with a profit center already built in. Your tenants already there. Uh, you also got a down payment. You didn't use any money to buy your property. So in fact, you got paid to buy it with a check mm-hmm. at closing. Now, what's the downside to this? A lease yeah. option or buying a single family this way because there's a lot well, of ways to buy single things. families, right? Right. That's what because we're talking about pros and cons, right? So there's the the pro of being able to get. So well, first of all, uh, in this market cycle right now, let's talk about some some cons as well um, in in the buying aspect because uh, in this market cycle, 
where like the house across the street sold three times in two months, right? Just flipped over mm-hmm. many times, which ex- is exactly what happened in 2008, 2007, two, you know, six, seven, and eight. It was a really skyrocketing market and it was almost impossible. You, you, you basically could buy the completely, you could buy a piece of crap and it was du- it doubled in value in a very short period of time. It's impossible mm-hmm. to lose money. <clears throat> so kind of what's going on right now. So what's the con to that? Uh, listen, well, the con- oh, go ahead, uh, Gabe. I was just going to say, the, the, one of the major cons is you have you have one roof and you have one tenant. So anything that's maintenance wise it depends on this one tenant. So there's there's just not a lot of income all the time to be able to help cover a lot of these expenses. And so so I know that in my experience, if you're doing a buy and hold, for example, it's something that you got to this is why buying right is extremely important. And, and And when I say buying right, it's not just the price. It's making sure that you're buying a property that doesn't necessarily have major work that's coming around in the next year or two. Uh, things like a roof or changing the windows, especially when you're changing things that don't add value to the property. So a roof won't add value to your property. A roof is supposed to be there. It's supposed to be working. Same thing with windows and stuff like that. But on, on th- that's really the downside of, of, a, of a single family home as an investment. Uh, but again, you know, the, the, the pro to that is if you do it the way Frank is discussing it. So if you're doing a lease option, there's, there's, there's a possibility of making a lot of money with that. So really it depends on the strategy you're going to employ and the time you're going to buy this at. Well, I see a con as well as right now, or you can see it as a pro, but it's very hard to get the right deal at the right price when the market's hot. So it's going to be, but the, 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 the pro to that at the same time, it's a con and a pro at the same time is that you can sell it quickly for a higher price because the market's going up. So you can isolate buy it, at the, you know, even taking over debt or doing a subject to or contract mm-hmm. for deed or, you know, there's a lot of ways of tying up property and, and, you know, having control versus ownership, another conversation for another day, even a sandwich lease option, but you could have all these different strategies to acquire the asset and then make the spread on the, uh, on the, um, on the tenant, on the monthly payment and the sale. However, you're not really buying and holding either. You're selling the golden goose. Like the, that property is going to go away. That cash flow is going to go away. Yes. You're tying it up. Okay, you're going to get cash, but then you're, you've sold the asset. Now you have to do it again, right? And it's feast and famine, feast and famine again. So the upside is you're going to get cash if they perform. If they don't perform, we can discuss that in a second, right? So there's a pro to them performing, and there's, and there's also a pro if they don't perform. Because, again, we can go in pro and cons into, into this. So many strategies with so many pros and cons, but right. um, um, go ahead, Gabe. I know your your finger was up for a second. I don't know if you're oh, yeah, I was just saying, well, asking for well, attention. I don't know. If, I don't think my nose is around here. Not no. yet. I know I got a big nose, but so yeah, yes. In terms of if it's a lease option, yes. But if you're buying and you want to resell because you can resell quickly, that's speculative too. So even though it's considered maybe a pro because of the market cycle, the issue is that you never know when you're hitting that peak. And if you bought at the peak and then it crashes you're in big trouble because before it get back to that, anywhere near that value, you, you may one, never get there or two wait, you know, a decade. And then your return on your investment is, is, is going to be ridiculously terrible. So be careful with that. That's not something I, I wouldn't consider that a pro uh, unless you have a, 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 but even if you have a tenant buyer, uh, depending on the t- down payment they put down, if you bought now at the, at the peak of the, of the real estate market in the single family house, and you have an agreement to sell them at a higher price because that's how you would do this in lease option. They may just say it's not worth buying it and it's better off losing my deposit because I can get the same house for a lot less than I'm losing in terms of the deposit. So exactly. you got to be extremely careful. This is, it's, it don't, I, values is, is a crazy, crazy thing. And don't, don't think that you can sell anything you buy at a higher price anytime. That's just not the way life works, unfortunately. No, uh, on that note, uh, what, well, you both have touched on it. Uh, the con right now with the single family is it is a hot market and you're most likely, if, if you're not careful, uh, may overpaying for that uh, single family home. And it's going to be very difficult for you to unload it in a lease option uh, to buy. But uh, uh, going back to another con of, of single family is you have limited um, exit options at different times. So right now I see single family there's a, there's a, there's a, there's, there is a pro and there's a con. The con is, yes, you don't want to buy it outright at a higher value because it is a hard market. But at the same time, like what Marco, you, you just mentioned, uh, there's going to be some great opportunities to take this over uh, these single families creatively. 
uh, because a lot of people are uh, perhaps in arrears with their, their mortgage and you can just take over the existing debt, make it whole and, and you're good. So that's very little, um, you can get into a property for maybe next to nothing. Uh, maybe just, you know, uh, uh, a couple of bucks to the seller just to, to get out and, and to save their credit. Ultimately, you're helping them out to save their credit. Say, here, here's, here's a few change, here's a few bucks, find something else, save your credit. We'll take over from here. So, uh, and, and when the market declines, you can, you know, step in as well. So if, if, you know, many people are buying right now with, you know, very low down with, because uh, it's available. And if the, when the markets drops, let's say 20% and they're, they're, they, they're, they're going to be some properties that are going to be upside down that you can just scoop up by taking over the debt with really low interest rates. <clears throat> so it's not just also the amount that you buy it for. It's, you know, how much the cash flow is going to be if it's a very low mortgage and you can get even lower than market rent just to pay the mortgage. So eventually it recovers. It's a free house that you can get. So there's a lot of pros and cons there as well. Gabe, go ahead. Sorry. I interrupted. Oh you. yeah. I just want to kind of maybe bring us back on track, which is we were discussing the pros and cons of each asset class. Listen, at the end of the day, I think what's clear is that depending on the cycle, every asset class is going to be the right asset class at a certain time. It's just about understanding what the real pros and cons of each are so that you can benefit from the pros and really minimize your cons or at least manage the risks of these cons. And a lot of it is is based on market cycles, basically the right time to buy. And uh, at the same time, it's going to be the strategy you're using to get them. And obviously, if, if you're getting a good deal in terms of the, the valuation, that's what's going to be always the driver. But yeah, so I, th I think for the single family homes, we've kind of killed the pros and cons here. Well, actually, there's still one more pro, uh, which we, we just brushed upon. But, uh, but wait, there's more. There's more. Wait. There's one more. Well, it happened to us. It, it happened to uh, one of our properties uh, where, yeah, we had a down payment. We had a, we had a tenant in their family. Uh, they made a down payment of $10,000. They were leasing the property. They ha we had a three-year option to buy. And, you know, shit hit the, hit the fan. They had some family issues. They got a divorce and they, they didn't perform on the option side. So they had a certain member on an option. There's a, there's a, there's a, there's a maturity date. And if they don't buy the property at the agreed price by that maturity date, they lose their deposit. In this case, it was 10,000. So the pro to that is yes. Okay. Sadly, he, they didn't buy it, but then I was able to do another lease option um, or with another $10,000 <laughs> deposit. So you're basically getting uh, those installments. And if they don't perform, they don't perform. And if they do, then great. Uh, you have it sold at a higher price. And if someone wants to walk away, Gabe, like you said, because like, fuck it, I'm going to go buy something more cheaper. They still forfeit their, their, their initial down payment, whether it's 10, 15,000. So you still made it. Yeah. But that's the pro of a lease option, not necessarily a single family home. Cause you can do this with a duplex, a triplex as well. Right. So uh, it's, it's, and you're correct. It is. But it's that's, a that, that's the, the yeah that's that's this. that's the pro of the mechanism, not necessarily the Correct. asset class. The strategy, True. that's right. Yeah, yeah. yeah. but yeah. it's yeah. mostly yeah. used. It's, in my it's, opinion, it's, it's mostly it's a lot used easier. on a single yeah. family. It's hard to do, lease triplex. option. It's it's hard to lease option a assisted living facility. Yeah. It's going to be right. hard to do that. Yeah, uh, for it's sure. Master lease. <laughs> yeah, different, could. Di different. Well, different. You could master lease option actually yeah. a yeah. a and this is living facility. It's, it's it's different, but it's the same. Yeah, <laughs> it's exactly the same yet completely different. Yes, but uh, yeah. So there's okay. So I think single family um, we nailed. Uh, so a you have to buy it right. Uh, so based on the market cycle, if we just to recap, uh, you know there's pros and cons to the market cycle. Uh, if the market's going up, uh, make sure that you're not caught with your pants down on the on the downside. So I would definitely not use credit based. I would definitely use creative strategies as the market heats up. Uh, just because if you do something that's credit based loan and the market collapses, which has to happen every look at what's going on every you know eight 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 years ten Seven, years eight years yeah. you know it's <clears throat> historically since the nineteen since the dawn of time there's, you know the market cycle's gone up and down up and down up and down it's just how it works so there's different strategies for at different times uh, but but that's market cycle and then that market cycle will affect different asset classes in different ways so for example single family. Uh, if you buy too high and it collapses, you're going to lose. However, there's opportunities that you can cap capitalize in within that asset class. Uh, on the exit strategy side, you can do a lease option, which is good in that you've got it sold. It's bad. You only have one tenant. It's also good that you can sell it over and over and over again. I've had a lease option uh, property that I've sold three different times and it tripled in value during that time. So there, there's definitely some advantages if you know what you're doing, which goes into education. You know, Ignorance is very expensive. Very so expensive. if you exactly, so if you don't know what you're doing, you're you're gonna lose you're gonna lose your uh, your underwear. Uh, 
So, okay. So let's talk about another asset class. So we most go from single family to multifamily. So let's multifamily talk about multifamily. Okay. Let's talk about that real quick. So Frank, you, wanna you want to oh, slap that around? Or Gabe, Gabe, Gabe will start. Gabe. No, I just say, do you want to split them up? Multifamily, uh, let's say mobile home parks could be considered multifamily, but they're a separate asset class. Yep. Let's so do multifamily, you... single family. Uh, let's do multifamily. Then we'll do mobile home parks as a, as a separate one. And then we'll do okay. maybe some other bonus one if we have well, time. Well, multifamily, I, I think is the, the main pro is it's probably consistently the most stable asset class that that's out there. It's an asset class that will get affected on different market cycles, but not as much as the others. Uh, another really big pro is that you have, you know, a lot of, well, at least you have more families. So more than one tenant for each roof. So that's, that's easier on maintenance because it's, it's a smaller percentage of each unit rented to be able to, to pay off some of these expenses and any other pros. I mean, the, the, you know, one of the big pros for me in multifamily is that it's value-based it's based on the income. So you, as an owner, you know, the way you take care of your property and the way you deal with it, the way you manage it are able to a certain extent control your income and therefore the value of the property. So I think that's a big pro. Um, it's, it's, it could be a con for some if they don't know how to manage. Uh, and maybe that's one of the cons is, is it's, it's a different beast. It's a different animal in terms of management. You really need to know what you're doing and to be able to scale. Um, I don't know if you guys have anything else. It's, it's, it's very hard to find cons. Well, the multifamily con is really the valuation where it's, it's really hard to find a really or create a really good deal with multifamily. It's, it's, it's probably the hardest asset class where you can create a, a, create a great deal. Not to say that it's impossible. It's, you know, we do it all the time, but it's just, you have to work a lot harder at those ones than you would other asset classes. Go ahead, Frank. No, I was just gonna. I was just gonna say something on that on that comment. Yes, it is. It is difficult to find. Like I like. I love multifamily, but uh, it is. It is difficult to find a great deal. But I think on one episode we talked about creating uh, a great deal as well. And also, when you get the property, you know, we talked about profit centers. You know, what can you do to improve it to make it a fantastic deal uh, down the line? So yeah, multifamily. I think is uh, right now. That's why you know uh, you know the market's kind of drying up in certain uh, cities uh, because it doesn't matter what my uh, market cycle you're in. If it is a hot market uh, or, or a low market and it dips down in price because you bought it on income on the income approach, uh, as long as you don't sell it, you're not crystallizing your loss or your losses uh, for that matter. So you're, you're riding on that wave. And, you know, as far as I know, you know, people always need a roof over their head. Um, I think it's just easier to uh, maintain. Like if you're looking at a 10 unit, it's easier to maintain one 10 unit building versus 10 single family homes or, you know, five duplexes. Um, it, it's just easier for the manager to take care of it, easier for the repairs, insurance and all that. Because if you add up 10 insurances or whatever it is. The economies for, of scale. Yeah. Exactly. <clears throat> so mm-hmm. I, I like it for that aspect of it. I, the force appreciation I love, of course, uh, I like the, the, the diversity of risk where, you know, the, the vacancy is part of the equation, right? You're, you're never going to base your, your value on hundred percent occupancy where in single family, if you do have, you know, if you have a vacancy and you have a mortgage, it's instant negativity, right? Where if we have a vacancy in a multifamily, it's part of the deal and it, it's a easier to manage the risk. Also, uh, I hate to say it a lot easier to find them, well, maybe not to find the money because there's a lot of single family opportunities as far as money available now with asset-based lending as well, even asset-based, excuse me, asset-based lending. Um, but it doesn't always cash flow um, if, if you do it right as well. So th- that's the next, I guess, a con that we didn't talk about is the cash flow of a single family. Uh, on, if you're buying it with uh, specifically as the market heats up and the values increase, uh, it's costing more and more for the property. And there's going to be a breaking point with how much you can pay for something versus how much the, the debt service can, can, you can handle the debt service. I've seen a lot of properties, for example, a three unit where, you know, you can get a great deal. It's, it's worth maybe 400,000. You can still, you can buy it for 250, but you can't make a cash flow because the, the tenants don't, the, the, this debt service is more than even what the gross income is of, of the property because of just how the, you know, the economy's, are in those areas. So very interesting uh, a piece to look at as well. But um, I guess 
I don't, I find it amusing because you're saying it's a lot harder to find multifamily, you know, deals. It's not, it's, you're never going to find them. You definitely have to create them. So it comes back to your skill sets. You know, I, I, I do want to put a big asterisk around what Frank said. Uh, and Frank, you can correct me, you know, which you've done multiple times and as Gabe has as well is and it, it's fine. I don't have to be right. Uh, it's, 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 if you know what you're doing, it's going to take you more time and more skill sets, but there are deals there that can be created all day long. Cause there's always going to be people that need to sell because of divorce, need to sell because of medical issues, need to sell because of, you know, whatever their issues are, they need to sell quickly. And there's always going to be a market, pl- a place for someone like us that is, uh, that buys for speed uh, and in exchange for some equity. Now, but as the economy changes, you know, it's going to be hard. It's, it's more and more difficult to do that. But as the economy tumbles, it's going to be a lot easier to do that as well. So there's a pro and a con there as well. Go ahead, Gabe. But for an investor also, I guess the one other con of the multifamily is just there's a lot of competition out there for people who want multifamily. That's, you know, a lot of, I think the more traditional or the traditionalists are in a buy and hold, you know, always looking for multifamily. That's kind of the asset class they're looking for because that's what they know. That's what they're taught. uh, That's what their parents did. Uh, there's other asset classes that are maybe less uh, popular or, or less out there that, that people are less familiar with where you'll find better returns. But there's definitely going to be a lot more competition to buy a multifamily than there would be for some other, other asset classes, including want- mobile home parks, which maybe we'll talk about next because there's usually a lot less competition for mobile home parks. Well, it uh, cycles because yeah. of the nature yep. of the asset. Yeah. Yep. 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 I just wanted to add something before we move on to the different asset classes in terms of repairs. So uh, I know from uh, repairing a, a single family, it's a lot easier in terms of uh, regulations and permits and things like that versus a commercial. Commercial, they, they really scrutinize what you're doing because it is commercial uh, space um, and, and there's a little bit more red tape. Um, that you have to go through and get, you know, the, the fire marshal involved and you got to get the, uh, the building, the city building inspector involved or whatever residential you're, you're, yes, you do need permits, but it's, it's a lot more easier process, uh, because you have your family or in there, or you, you know, it's just, it, there's still people living in there, of course. And, and you, you want to make sure that they are safe and, and the, the structure is, uh, safe and sound, but I just found doing both residential and commercial commercial is a lot more scrutiny on what you can do and what you can't do. Um, mm-hmm. you can't move shit around and you can't, you know, take out a, if you, if you change the footprint at all on a commercial, uh, guess what? You need new drawings, uh, from, from an engineer and from an architect. And then that's going to be, uh, submitted to the city for for their stamp of approval. So uh, repairs could be a little bit daunting for uh, commercial. Uh, it's just a lot more uh, involved. So I wanted to add that. Yeah, makes sense. Makes sense. Also, yeah. I think management management's easier to find on multifamily as well than other asset classes. I, finding uh, you know someone to manage a hotel is going to be a completely different beast than uh, you know multifamily. It's a lot easier yeah. to find management. Even single family is going to be easier to find management than in, in multifamily than single family because finding a good manager in single family sometimes doesn't. The economies well, of scale, scale don't make right? sense. Exactly, you yeah. need more. To, yeah. it, it it really chews into your profit center if if you have a single family paying ten percent of you know to to collect one check is a lot harder to swallow than if they're collecting one hundred and fifty checks, right? Yeah. So, yeah, agreed, absolutely. All right. So single fan. And by the way, listener, if you know of any other pros and cons, uh, let us know. And uh, I know we're leaving a lot on the table here. All of our, our discussions are completely like off the cuff. We have not, you know, I'm, we always say things and we're like fudge sickles. You know, that's exactly how we yeah, communicate with exactly each other. those words. Yes. Yeah. Golly gee willikers, boys. We should have said this. Uh, no, uh, we're like, damn, we should have, you know, really mentioned this and that. Gosh, so. darn it. <laughs> yes, exactly. Golly, sir. All right. So, uh, so single families, multifamily, let's do mobile home parks. One of our favorite asset classes. We've all, all right. owned well, many of those and still do. It's, it's, yeah, it is. It's, uh, and that one's an interesting beast. So I guess <laughs> let's, we start with the pros of the, the <laughs> there's the, the main pro of a mobile home park. is just the cash flow is insane. It's, it's just oh. a cash printer. Uh, it, it's the, the cons will be the ones Legal that are going to cash printer. Th- yeah, that's right. It's, I guess the cons will be the one that directs you as to whether or not you're comfortable with, with that type of cash printer, but it's, it's, so I guess the cash flow for me is, is the most important ca- uh, con- uh, pro. I, I don't think there are that many others that I can think of. 
uh, the, the, the cons, you know, uh, one is a lot of the mobile home parks for the most part. And, and, you know, I can't say all of them because that's not true. But if you're going to get some good returns, most of them are in, in more remote areas. So the fact that they're more remote areas will also create additional cons. So, you know, getting funding on a mobile home park is possible. It, it, you know, we've, we've all done it, but it's, it's, it's more difficult than, let's say, a traditional multifamily. Uh, also, the type of tenant that you have in a mobile home park, again, for the most part, because there's some really high-end mobile home parks out there. Uh, we're talking about, yeah, yeah pretty much what Marco, I don't know, if you're watching this, yeah, what Marco looks like is the type of tenant we have. Usually a little bit shorter, Mostly. more hair. Yeah. yeah, shorter and more hair. But other than that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, like that. Uh, and less teeth. And less teeth. <laughs> yeah, that's right. Yeah, less teeth. So that's that's the, the type of tenant. It's it's a different breed of of tenant. And that comes with another, maybe, I don't know what's a con. It depends on where you are. But, you know, finding the right management to be able to deal with that type of property and the type of tenant, you need someone who's, who's, who's really prepared for this and, and, and can handle that. So there's, there's a lot of cons to a mobile home park in, in general, but the, the cash flow that comes from it, if you're, you have the proper controls in place is, is just absolutely insane. And, and, and I guess that's the additional pros. There's a lot less competition for these because of all these cons. So if you know what you're doing, it's uh it's, it's an, it's an amazing world. Comes down to skill set. Go ahead, Frank. No, I just wanted to add, well, with the financing part, and the reason it's it's more difficult to get financing on mobile home parks is because you're buying, oh, basically, yeah, they're in rural areas, like you said, Gabe, because they're, you know, it was a cow patch or whatever before they had mm-hmm. sheeps there at one time. But uh, it's not that. It's just the, the, the units themselves, the mobile homes are classified as personal property, like a vehicle, like your car. And personal property tends to depreciate as opposed to, excuse me, as opposed to appreciate like a brick and mortar uh, building or home. Um, So that's why lenders are perceived that as, okay, we're just going to lend on the land part of it. They will look at the income approach with it, but they'll lean more towards the land and they'll look at the income approach for it. So uh, from a financing perspective, yes, there's a little bit more hurdles, but there are lenders out there that uh, some of them just strive on that. That's all they lend on. And they found their little niche uh, to do that. But, but also in terms of, um, the, uh, the pro, listen, I don't know where else you're going to live for like five, 400 bucks a month or $600 a month. It's, it's affordable living. And, and, you know, pretty much every state, every city needs affordable living to, to some degree. Uh, as long as you provide a safe, clean and, and affordable environment or, or park uh, or community, if you want to call it that, uh, you're going to have no problems filling that place up. Uh, because people are coming in there, they may not have, maybe they're on fixed income, you know, older people I had in, in our park, we had a lot of older people, right? They're on fixed income and they're, they're watching their pennies and to live for $500 in, in a relatively safe community, other than the, you know, the 65 year old stabbing the 75 year old, which is another story. Um, it, it's, it was a safe community and, you know, for After 500 pa- bucks, crime of passion, it was a <laughs> yeah, crime, crime of, of passion. passion. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Uh, but uh, so I, the pro is that you will, be able to fill it up um, if it's relatively close to a bigger metropolitan area um, and, and you are providing those elements that it is safe and, and affordable. But uh, what else would be the, the con? Uh, sorry. If you, uh, did you have a comment? I have a lot. Go ahead. But, no. Go ahead. Mm-hmm. No. no, one of the con that I found with our park, uh, Marco is, is it, it, you know, some of them because they are, they're in remote areas, they may not have the infrastructure, like the servicing, uh, the lot may not be servicing. So that what I mean by that is city water probably didn't reach that area or electric, uh, electric is always there, but city water or, and city sewer probably didn't reach that area. So a lot of these parks may have septic, like we had septic tank and, and f- uh, drain fields. Uh, we had city water, but the sewer we didn't. So we had to rely on the septic. So with that comes infrastructure issues. Uh, but like anything else, <clears throat> there's a cost to it. As long as you maintain it, you know, the shit flows. Uh, per se. Well, it's mm. supposed to anyway. It's supposed to flow. That's right. Yeah. yeah. So management also, uh, that's a, a squirrely one because there's a, there's a, there, sometimes you want someone that's in the park. Uh, like my, I have a student of mine that's about to close on a park in, um, in New York. Uh, it's 36 pads. It can go to 50. So there's some gro- growth there. Uh, it, it's not been very well maintained. So you got maintain maintenance issues that are going to squirrel up, you know, over time. Um, and, but where can you live for $600 a month and have 
you know, uh, you know, or less and have grass, you know, your own place. You can be outside and you have two or three bedrooms and, you know, you have your own place. It's very, very economical. Um, so again, it comes down to skill sets as well. So you have to make sure you have the right management uh, process because there's a lot of ways to manage a mobile home park. Uh, there's, and if you don't have the right management team, it can really degrade your park. Um, we're talking pros and cons, not de- devil in the details here, but also there's, you know, different section eight programs or VA programs that you can get into that can really up your game on, on, on the, uh, profitability as well on your mobile home park. Uh, the downside as well is weather. You know, if you've ever heard of a tornado, they look for mobile homes. It's kind of how yeah. it works. You know, if there's where, where's the mobile home, that's where I want to go. Uh, you know, we've had I've had multiple mobile home parks destroyed uh, through tornadoes and uh, even hurricanes. Yeah. Frank, I know you, you were destroyed yep. you know, in Panama City. A lot of your properties were gone. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, even uh, Dawson and Shirley's Park in New York uh, in, in Florida, they were you know, disappeared. The whole park disappeared. Now, again, you want the right insurance called you want a wind rider because the wind rider will basically, and you want loss of revenue insurance, which are not that expensive considering it's insurance. You're going to pay for it anyway. And it's your tenants that are paying for it. It, You know, you're not paying for it. The tenants are, so you can't look at it as a cost as as an invest more of as an investment because when that tornado hits or that hurricane hits, you got a brand new park, right? They, They pay for your loss of revenue and they pay for all the brand new homes because those, those are gone. Uh, and so now you're, because you have new homes in a new community, your rents go up and you have less maintenance costs. So you're actually making more money. So there's the, the, the con is, okay, the insurance costs a little bit more. Who cares? Uh, because if something does happen and when it does happen, it's not a matter of if, but a matter of when. That's right. You're, you're taken care of. So, and again, just making sure that you understand all these things. And that's why it's important to have a mentor that really has been through a lot of garbage and a lot of shit. So you understand, you know, what to do proactively and not, you know, be stuck with your pants down a lot of these things because you'll learn a lot. There's, there's only so much you can put into a book, right. Or a tape or a video or, you know, whatever. It's very difficult. Real world experiences is, is Podcast. a completely different thing. Oh my, ugh, completely well, especially thing. that every property yeah. is, is different, right. It's, it's, it's own yes. animal, even though within its own asset class. So, right. yeah. well, you know, the, All the, right. the, the, the sugar, I'm not going to say the na- last name of the, the park that you, but you know, how much of you, we learn over sugar, you know, the, the, the property yeah. that we yeah. have there. And, oh my God. uh, you know, in the other, in Arkansas, Frank, the, the, what we had there, the, you know, the, yeah, you know, please. Oh yes. You know, that was, that was, you know, the, the, that was the, one of the worst. That was one yeah, of the worst, you know, and, even, you know, the, the one that Linda was managing in, in Florida, you know, in, in Perry, yep. the cove. Uh, you know, the, yeah, the cove mm-hmm. just it's it's, you know, you, you, and the, you learn something all the time. It's like it's never like you think, you know, everything. And then a tenant does something or something happens to a property like I've never seen that shit before. Like, how does that even possible? <laughs> it's like, who does that? Fuck. Yeah, yeah. And, it, it and, keeps you it keeps you on your toes. That's for sure. In all asset oh, classes, that's what makes it even, fun. That's exactly. You're always learning something. So anyway, so let's z- zip back into. Zip back. Uh, yes. Uh, so we have financing. Uh, you, there's a great upside potential too in mobile homes if you understand what you're doing. It doesn't take a lot to make them really nice. Uh, and I'm talking. I'm not talking like you know marble countertops and you know uh, you don't want to overdo uh, on a mobile home park. Although you can, I've seen. Uh, I had a really nice mobile home park. Uh, just outside of Orlando and it was a retirement community and it was very high end actually. Uh, you yeah. know, you have, it's almost an A-class park where there are a lot of snowbirds. People live there, you know, most of the time of the year there's, you know, swimming pool. It's beautiful. Right. But you know, it's a different class of people as well. So anyway, let's That's go back to pros and cons, pros and cons, pros and cons, back on track, back on track. So what's the next asset class you want to talk? Have we hit it all on, on mobile homes? Well, we, we hit it all, but we hit the majority of them. Yeah, hotels, yeah. Uh, yeah. hospitality, and then we're we're going to be done because this is going to yeah. drag on for ten years. So hospitality. So let's talk about pros and cons. Let's first start with acquisition. We should have different plan this better. Should we have acquisition? Then we have this management, and then you know humans. That's the biggest problem with <laughs> hotels. But let's get into. Let's, <laughs> go ahead. Go ahead, Frank. Pros and cons. Well, uh, well, uh, well, right now I, you know, I'll let it out of the bag. Hospitality obviously took a took a beating uh, uh, over the last year and a bit uh, with with uh, with COVID. Um, so that would be the biggest con right now. Where uh, slowly but surely people are coming back. Uh, there is a lot of domestic traveling going on as you know the borders open up. So 
it, it's it's marketing. So right now with with hospitality, everyone is fighting for that guest. Everyone's fighting for that night, for that room. And what's happening is, yes, rates are going up, uh, like the daily rates are going up slightly, but there's still a lot of inventory out there and people are just trying to recuperate what they lost before. So that would be a con with a silver lining, if you want to call it that. And it depends uh, on the hotel, if, if it's flag, and so a flag hotel, if it's branded, like a, you know, Marriott or Hilton franchise. or Red Roof or whatever franchise, uh, there's, there's cons to that, uh, where, you know, uh, that company or that flag or franchise or, uh, wants to see that brand or that room a specific way. And they call them property improvement plans where you have to, you know, they're going to say, well, we'll fucking change in all the linens, the bedspreads, and we're changing all the artwork on the walls. So now you're stuck with, uh, you know, a, a, a capital expenditure that you have to do. Now, they'll give you time to do it, of course. Uh, but you're kind of at the uh, at the mercy dependent. of the franchise. Yeah. yeah, you're kind of dependent on them because they're doing their marketing. They're driving the customers there with their brand power. Um, mm -hmm. So I would find that as for me, that would be a con uh, as opposed to an independent, which. Uh, yes, Marco. So hang on a second. I just want to, yeah. cause we flowed into a different, different ideas pretty quickly there. So, okay. the, the, so the, the, the big, the big con is, or a pro and a con is having like a franchise, right? So if you have a franchise uh, and the, the pro of that franchise is they're driving traffic, right? They're bringing right. traffic to you. Yes. Like for example, I only stay at Marriott properties. I, I'm an ambassador at Marriott, which means I stay way too long in hotels. I'm not bragging. It's actually disappointing. You have to stay three months in a hotel and then they give you an ambassador status, which means, hey, you can check in whenever you want and you can check out whenever you want within a 24 hour period. That's my perk. So that's it. Um, other than that, pay like everyone else. So it's 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 uh, Marriott properties that I stay at. But that Marriott, like like Frank said, if they it's owned by a person, right? It's not owned by Mr. Marriott. It's owned by, you know, Mr. and Mrs. Whoever it is, and they run it. And if if Marriott says all the linens have to be changed, oh the carpet has to be changed. We don't. Uh, the signs now are going to a new signage, which they just did. Those are called property improvement plans or PIPs, and it could cost millions of dollars. I think we had a we were looking at a hotel where what was the PIP on this? Like five million for the PIP or something crazy. Oh it was God, it, yeah. it was bananas. It was. It, it, it was insane. So you can have these, it, it costs almost the same as to, it is to buy the actual hotel uh, on these, on these property improvement plans. It's, it's extremely expensive. So that's definitely a drawback. Um, and with what with Frank was saying with, with the economy, the way it is, we took a bath. I have, to, I'm heavily invested in hospitality and, you know, I have, I'm still bleeding um, every month. Luckily I have different asset classes that are recovering from that, but you know, Frank, Frank and Gabe know like some of these hotels, I'm still, you know, down upside down, like a hundred grand a month. You know, it's, it's a lot, but it's slowly chipping away at that, which would kill most humans. Right. But luckily I have enough to balance things out. So no big deal. <clears throat> and I would never thought I would be able to say that in my lifetime when I was first growing up saying a hundred thousand, I'd never even seen in one place ever. And now I'm, you know, I'm losing that every single month, but just to get back on track and Gabe will um, go ahead. If, well, I just wanted to segue off that is 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 the con here is is a hotel is not just real estate. It's it's an actual business. business. Yes. So so that's that's kind of something that you 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 can't really separate here. Well, in theory you could because you can technically, you know, at lease out the the operations and then just collect rent, but typically, you know, most the the, the best way to monetize this is to actually operate the hotel. But yeah, and that's the part where you know you're more susceptible to economic downturns, right? So or upturns. Yeah, or or upturns. Where Owen is, you know, about to uh, to complete a transaction in in Green Bay, where you know they're 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 renting the rooms during a game at nine hundred ninety nine dollars a night, and they're sold out mm -hmm. nine ninety nine a night at one hundred and seventeen rooms. That's uh, that's a good chunk of change, for you know. Sure that's that's a that's a do the math on that that's one hundred and seventeen thousand dollars a night and and the, it's a three it's a three night stay minimum that's a that's a three hundred fifty thousand dollar weekend right it's bananas uh so it's in one weekend right but that those are and there's only a certain amount of games a year that you can do that and so there's it's that's the thing is so the pro of a hotel is you can raise your rents nightly and lower your rents nightly. There's no control. There's yeah. no control exactly. So you're the market is going to tell you what you can get away with. Uh, and at well, that time, uh, 
so I, I wanted to uh, well, I wanted to chime in on that. There is actually control on a flag hotel. Um, you, you you do have flexibility to change your your daily rate, but they they keep it within. You have to keep within a certain margin because they. Mm-hmm. Uh, unless depends. that changed uh, again. Well, it depends if, if if you have the flag, if you have permission again, it's it's you have to ask mom and dad. Right. Yes. So as long as you're asking mom and dad. So the answer is yes, Frank. But the other answer is if if if, for example, if a super eight is charging five hundred dollars a night. Right. So a super eight hotel motel, a super eight motel, not a hotel. This is an exterior corridor, you know, uh, from the 1960s, you know, uh, you know, where the cockroaches are everywhere. They're charging 500 bucks a night. And I'm not saying super eights are like that. I'm just saying this particular hotel is yuck. Uh, it, it, like even in Vegas, you know, you go to a fight night in Vegas. Uh, oh I, I, I could stay at the Cosmo. Um, I get a, I stay there a lot. I, I, the most I'll pay for a room is about 250 bucks a night uh, max. That's the most I'll generally want to spend. Um, and during a fight night, it can be 12,000, 12. I've seen the same room that I stay in because they give me a really nice wraparound suite at the Cosmo for 12, 13, $14,000 in one night for that same room that I would normally get. So it's it, because they can, right? So sorry, Frank, go ahead. No. So that would actually be then uh, another, it was that a pro or a con then geographic location and events or venues uh, within that area is going to dictate what you can potentially make during certain parts of the, well, during different times of the season. Right. 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 Uh, so. Well, the first quarter they lose money. The second quarter they break even the third quarter in this particular mm-hmm. asset that we're, we're discussing Owen Steele, mm-hmm. who's out of Victoria, by the way, in, in Canada, and he's never been to the U S since we've since COVID actually. So, and he's doing this without even stepping foot in, on U S soil uh, is, is literally, his his ability to uh, to get back on track. This hotel's pro is great revenue during hot times. The con is you're losing money at different times of the year. Like the first three months of the year, you're not making you're you're losing money. So you have to take the money that you're making over here, right, and then move it over here. So that's both a pro and, and the con to that same thing is if you don't have good revenue management, which is a human. If you don't have someone that's monitoring that, because that's that, that falls under revenue management, if you don't have someone that knows how to do that in advance, you're losing that opportunity. You're going to lose all the goodies of how to make the hotel really pro- profitable because a the hotel business, right? As as Gabe said, is a, a real estate. It's not the real estate business necessarily. It's also the the business itself. You have to have someone or a human, which is another huge con uh, or a pro, depending on how you want to look at it. Because if you have good people, it's great. If you have bad people, it's terrible uh, to really manage that business to, to make it grow properly. Yeah. And I think another pro, I mean, con actually is with any hotel, whether it's independent or uh, a flag or a franchise, is your, 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 your operating expenses in terms of uh, manpower, payroll, is, is more significant than any other asset class that I know of. Uh, maybe uh, ALF is uh, more demanding on it, but uh, hotel will demand because you need housekeepers, you need front desk people, you need shifts because they can't work 24 hours a day, at least not yet. Uh, we don't have the magic pill to do that, but uh, you, you're going to need a, you know, an AGM and a manager and, and, and all that uh, maintenance uh, person or, or persons for that matter. So uh, and whether you serve breakfast or not, then you have, you know, a hosp- you, know you have like uh, food and beverage, right? Area. So there is a lot of uh, demand. I think that's one of the highest costs on a franchise thing is your payroll. Uh, Marco, maybe yeah. you can allude to more than that because you, you, you have a, it is. a substantial size hotel. It is, right? So when we look at the, uh, the expenses and, and the, the finances of a hotel, that's a big chunk uh, out, of the, out of the revenue for sure. Uh, and, uh, I think I want to touch on the last con, if we can, before we wrap this up there. It's it's the due diligence part on a hotel is a whole other animal compared to, you know, multifamily or any other asset class for that matter. Because, like Absolutely. I said, it is a business. So you have to pay attention. You got to know what you're doing. Uh, it's it's uh, it's and, and if you do it right, that's where you're going to win. But if you do it wrong, it's, you know, you can take a real big bath if uh, if you're not paying attention. So due diligence is. You know, I guess for us, now that we've done this multiple times, it's almost a pro because we know what to do and how to do it and where to look. But at at the onset, I could definitely, you know, go back to where I was when the first time I was looking at this. And it is a con. It's something that's very, very difficult to do if you're if you're faced with it the first couple of times. 
for sure. And if you know what you're doing, specifically now with with the market being hit, there's a lot of folks that haven't been able to survive the storm and are selling their assets at pennies on the dollar, literally pennies on the dollar, not even two times revenue, which if you're not in the business, you don't know what that means. But, um, you know, a place makes a million bucks, you can sell it, buy it for under two million bucks, uh, which is phenomenal. Really, it's almost given away. So, and again, it, it comes down to the more experience and the more knowledge you have and the more you have the right team around you, you don't have to know everything about everything at all. You just have to have the right consultant or the right mentor or the right person next to you to tell you exactly what to do so you don't make the mistakes. And uh, I would rather write a check for someone all day long so I don't make the mistakes. And in fact, we do that all the time. We started a private mm-hmm. equity fund. We did the same thing. We're going to write checks to whoever's necessary at whatever cost in order for us to get the right result. And because a mistake is much more costly or not doing the business is much more costly than actually making the mistake or not doing it at all, because not doing it is much, that's the worst, wor- the worst result is not getting the result that we're looking for, you know? So that's kind of how we look at things. So holy crap, that was like a three hour marathon. Uh, oh might God. be the longest one we've done yet, but that's okay. We actually got complaints saying that our podcasts aren't long enough, but um, that's, that's all good. Okay. Uh, yeah, it's all good. So man, we've run through a whole bunch of gambits. Uh, we've missed a lot. Like I have about yeah. 19 things that I want to talk about, but we just probably don't have any time. Uh, and yeah, so what, what, so pro and con to single family. Uh, obviously we did talk about the biggest pro in the hotel business, which is making millions of dollars a year. You know, that's kind of the, the advantage of having a hotel is if you know what you're doing, uh, it's, you know, you, you never have to work again on one hotel and if you do it right. So it's, right. it's extremely profitable. <clears throat> and uh, yeah, so that's that. So for now, we're going to cap it right there. Uh, Gabe, Frank, appreciate you both. And uh, listener, of course, appreciate you as well. Uh, next episode will be our 99th episode. And we're going to yes. do some cool stuff on the 99th episode. Uh, and we're going to not do the 100th episode until we're all together in the same place. We're going to celebrate our centennial uh, when we're all together. Uh, I'm also taking a uh, small little vacay for a period of time. I've historically taken two months off during the summer and uh, this is no exception, but uh, I still squeeze in some time for my, my family, uh, which are Frank and Gabe always. I'm looking forward to seeing you guys up in Canada uh, yes, very sir. shortly. And uh, same, guys, same. appreciate you all. And of course, the listener, like it, love it, share it. And I'm looking forward to uh, seeing your feedback, your emails, marco at marcokoslowski.com. And of course, if you really want to learn this business, we'd be delighted to help you in any way, shape or form. Thanks, guys. Appreciate you and have yourselves a fantastic week and a fantastic life. If you like this episode of Big Fat Real Estate Checks, then show some love by leaving a comment and a good rating. Also, as a thank you for tuning in today, we've got a special free gift. The journey to passive cash flow for a life starts by finding deals, and it's easier than you think. Simply go to getdealsbytuesday.com, enter your email address, and we'll send you a free quick start course called Deals by Tuesday. Even if it's 11 p.m. Monday night, This course will show you how to find discounted real estate deals by Tuesday. It's that fast and simple. Go to getdealsbytuesday.com and start your journey toward life-changing cash flow today. Thanks for tuning in, and we'll see you on the next episode. Mm